Hey y'all, my name is Priscilla and welcome back to my channel, Bookie Charm. For today's video, I wanted to talk about the romance books that I read last year. So this video may be a little late, but I'm gonna say it's right on time because I'm hoping to get this out in February and February is the month of love. So let's talk about all the romance books that I read last year. I didn't start reading books last year. I think my actual first romance book was from Alyssa Cole's Reluctant Royal series back in 2018. And I ended up starting off the year strong with reading the novella in that series called Once Ghosted Twice Shy. So this series in general is a contemporary romance series that follows Reluctant Royals and it's very special to me because it was my introduction to modern contemporary romances and I found that I really love Alyssa Cole and this book follows I think the first FF romance in that series. So this book is own voices, black representation, as well as queer representation, which I did not realize that Alyssa Cole identifies as queer until I found it in an article talking about this book. So I'll make sure to link that. But this is a second chance romance that follows Likotsi, who is the advisor to the king from the first book. She apparently had a romp, a love with Faviola during the events of that first book. So I did enjoy this novella, but I also had some issues with it, primarily with the conflicts in this story. In this story, Lakotsi and Fabiola are trying again. They are spending the day together. It takes place mostly over the span of one day. And there's a bit of a communication, well, a miscommunication issue because Fabiola's, and I hope I'm not getting into spoiler territory by saying this, but Fabiola is holding something from Lakotsky and it has to do with immigration. So I'll just say that. That miscommunication is fine. I'm okay with that more so than I think most people are. But uh, the bigger bad in my mind was immigration in this novella. And it's just really hard, I think, for any contemporary writer to resolve that in a way that's gonna be satisfactory for me because it's not simple and it's not easy to resolve a lot of those issues. But I will say that I did enjoy how Cole developed their relationship together in this very short novella, how loving and tender and considerate they are of each other's feelings and um, it, it's just a really great uh, relationship to see in a sapphic relationship in a novella like this. So again, the Reluctance Royal series is really special to me. I'm probably gonna continue on reading the series, but this one I had mixed feelings about. Also, side note, I'm going to be leaving all of the content warnings about all these books in the description box below. I don't think that I'm going to be able to remember those off the top of my head. And I'm gonna be talking about these books in the order that I read them throughout the year. They're not ranked any sort of way. So next up, I read The Infamous Miss Rodriguez by Lydia San Andres. This book is own voices for the Latinx representation as well as the Caribbean setting. Um, San Andres lives in the Caribbean and it takes place in a fictional Latinx Caribbean world in the early 1900s. This is a part of her series and I just really appreciate it because all the characters are Latinx and that's really important to me when I'm picking up historical romances that people of color are represented. This book in particular follows a Afro-Latinx heroine and a Argentinian descended hero. So this is also a novella and follows the heroine Graciela who is um, a socialite and that has this impending marriage that she's gonna have to be married soon, but she doesn't want to be married to this evil man of uh, this business transaction. She doesn't want to be a part of that. And she rebels and starts to cause a scene so that way that she won't be married to him. And her aunt hires Vicente to keep an eye on her and to keep her out of trouble. So there's a lot to love about this novella. There's a bunch of shenanigans with her trying to get in trouble. There's a lot of Vicente running around trying to clean up all her messes. And there's a lot of opportunity for discussion about classism and the opportunities that Graciela has that Vicente does it and that he is trying to take opportunity of with this job and to do better for himself. And there's also really fun dynamics with a fake marriage trope if you're into that as well. Uh, I will say that this book is probably one of the tamer ones in terms of the sex scenes. If you're interested in picking up romance, don't know where to start. You might want to start with historical romances like this where the sex scenes are a bit more tame. Vicente is a very soft hero. He's a very considerate 
different uh, sort of a love interest and I really appreciated that. Um, but for this, I feel like I really wanted a full length novel. I could have spent a full long length novel following all these characters, uh, discovering all of their uh, relationships with one another even deeper than we got in this novella. So good, but I wish I had gotten a little bit more with this. So next up, I read Idlewild by Jude Sierra. This is a contemporary romance that Yvette has been telling me I should get to, an author I should get to soon. So I got to it this past year. And this is an author that is Brazilian. And this is a book that features a male-male romance. But I did want to mention that the author is not male, is not a man. And uh, that's something that I should keep in mind when I pick up male male romances. And this is a story that is named after the restaurant where the two uh, love interests meet. Uh, Asher is dealing with the death of his husband. And five years later, his restaurant is failing. So he's trying to save it. He's hired this whole new staff. And of course, um, his love interest is uh, one of the hired new staff. Tyler is a very bubbly personality that is a sure to invigorate this new staff and also to Asher's life who he's obviously dealing with a lot of grief from his husband's death. So this story I feel like really uh, handled that grief so well and that's what I really liked about it. There's an opportunity for a new love even after having just everything seemingly taken from you and losing everything. I really like that high, uplifting levity to this romance. Although I will say there is an age gap romance in this. Tyler is fairly young. I believe he's in his mid twenties and Asher is in his forties. So if that's not something that you like, I, you might be wary of that. I typically don't like things like that, but um, it actually surprisingly worked for me here. So I didn't really have any issues with that. So Asher and Tyler are really sweet with one another. I really liked seeing their relationship bloom. I really liked that uh, this takes place in Detroit and there are some discussions about gentrification. Uh, Tyler is black, Asher is not. So there's that uh, classism as well discussed in this. And I just really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to reading more from Jude Sierra. Then next up, I wanted to pick up a romance by an Asian descended author because of Asian uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I picked up No Two Ways by Chi Yu Rodriguez. And this is a contemporary romance that I don't recommend. I didn't get along with this book really. And this is a novella that follows a bisexual Filipina woman in Manila. And it is own voices for that bisexual Filipina representation. So our main character AJ is a really badass engineer working in Manila that gets the opportunity to go on to this uh, TV show. And um, she has a one night stand with a woman, doesn't expect to see her again. And then of course, fate brings them back together. This woman is a makeup artist on these shows. So they are brought back together for that. What I didn't like about this book was it is just riddled with so much biphobia. And that was really hard for me to accept because her love interest is an asshole and is very biphobic. She's a lesbian that just is, is very inconsiderate with her feelings, with her identity, with not wanting to understand it, with not really accepting her, but tolerating her. But again, this is own voices for that bi rep. So I don't want to be too critical of it, but for me, it just wasn't easy for me to enjoy if I didn't really like the pairing together. What I did like about this book was a lot of the found family and the queer friends that AJ has are so supportive of her all the way. They do confront a lot of that biphobia that I had problems with. They confront a lot of transphobia and other issues that other members of their found family have. That supportive friend group is amazing. But I just couldn't get along with this because the final pairing just didn't work in my mind. You know, Jackie, the biphobic uh, love interest is just such a self-centered, terrible person. And although she does show some growth in this story, it just didn't feel like she truly accepted AJ for who she was. And I can't really get on board with romances where I don't like the final pairing. So the next two books I read were both by Sabrina Soul, so I'll probably talk about them together. The first is a novella called One Night More. Sabrina Soul is Mexican American, so she writes um, stories about Latinx folks mostly in LA so it's own voices for that representation. So the heroine in One Night More is named Vanessa. She's 30 years old 
And on her 30th birthday, she has made a bucket list of things that she wants to do. She was just broken up with her ex. And one of these things, of course, is to have a one night stand. Enter Mateo, our hero, who she hopes to never see again. But of course, being a romance novella, they're gonna meet again. And he actually works for her father, who is the hotel earner owner where they both work. So they're brought together by these circumstances and can't ignore the feelings that they have for each other. I really like how Sabrina Soul does Latinx families, how she does Mexican American representation, and how there's just a really loving connection between all the members of these families. She also does really strong uh, Mexican American heroines who are very ambitious and that are really boss women that I really enjoy, but also struggle with a lot of the obligations that they have to their families. In this story, she, Vanessa is the um, manager at her hotel and you know, there's a business conflict there with her entering a relationship with Mateo if she wants to choose to do that. So my issues with this book though, I think were some of the language that was used leading up to the sex scenes, some of the foreplay, and I just don't feel that the male, the, the hero in her stories and this is an issue I had with her other book that I'm going to talk about next I don't feel like the these men really talk to their love interests in a way that I like they're kind of condescending and um, I don't appreciate that and maybe that's just a me thing because the way that the foreplay works in these books um, it's the language that they use outside of the bedroom as well so it just comes across as condescending to me and uh, that's a big issue that I had with one night more so I thought well maybe I'll try a novel maybe there just wasn't enough uh, work enough pages to put in that fleshed out character development I wanted so I picked up another book called Delicious Temptation and this is a part of a series wherein she writes romances that feature heavily food and that is something that I really like so in Delicious Temptation we follow Amara who is a baker she had dreams of owning and running her own bakery and that failed she ends up coming back home and working at her family's bakery and the love interest hero here is named eric he's sort of a bad boy that has a dark past he's been missing for 12 years and suddenly pops up in la and he is actually a ex-best friend to Amara's brother. So there's a bit of a forbidden romance element to this because she shouldn't be dating her uh, brother's ex-friend and they have like this secret relationship thing going, which I actually was surprised I actually quite liked. Um, the food description in this obviously are amazing. She talks about this um, mango, I think it's tres leches cupcakes that sound amazing, made me really hungry. But again, the biggest issue I had with this book was how condescending her uh, hero is to her heroine. I just really didn't appreciate that. And that's kind of a nitpicky thing that just doesn't work for me. But again, I really like the family relationships here. I like how those really tight Mexican-American bonds are really shown in the family. I think that maybe romances like this may have worked for me years ago, but I'm just kind of over the whole stereotypical good girl, bad boy dynamic, which is obviously very prevalent here. And I, I don't really care for that. So I think that 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 is why I didn't end up liking this too much. And next up, I read American Dreamer by Adriana Herrera. And this is own voices for the Dominican American representation and Afro-Latinx representation. So American Dreamer is a male-male romance that features main characters named Nesto and Jude. Ernesto is opening his Afro-Caribbean food truck and he parks it right across the street from a library. And Jude happens to work as a librarian there. So I think it's very obvious that I have a thing for foodie contemporaries because this one also worked for me and I really enjoyed it. So I think that Jude and Nesto worked really well together. They are very caring for one another. They understand one another pretty well and they work through a lot of their problems. And uh, I really like the pace of this novel. There are a couple of conflicts here one being a caricature of racism of this white lady that is causing a lot of trouble for Nesto's food truck she doesn't want it parked in their very lush affluent neighborhood so she's kind of there and I think another um, conflict that kind of arises later on in the book is another 
issue of grief with some of the uh, health issues related in Jude's family. That's my non-spoiler way of saying that. And there's a little bit of homophobia wrapped up into that as well. So overall, I really like this book. I really liked uh, Nesto's great group of friends who are gonna be the main characters in their own stories in the later books in this series. And I really liked their pairing, how they work well together. And I really liked the whole foodie librarian thing. So um, this is another great contemporary romance. Then next up it was Halloween so I decided to pick up a Halloween paranormal romance called Halloween Boo by Sarah Spade. This is a really short sweet novella that is inspired by a hocus pocus I think fan fiction because the main character's name is Danny and she moves into a new apartment that is actually haunted by a ghost named Max. So yeah, super hocus pocus, but super fun. And I actually really liked it. I'm actually finding that I think I really like ghost boyfriend tropes. That's another thing that happens in another series that I really like by Meg Cabot. I don't know if I said Max before, but his name is definitely Zach, as in Binks the cat. Um, so I didn't really know what to expect going into this book. Uh, I haven't read an adult romance that features a ghost like this. And my biggest fear was that the ghost was gonna be creepy and that there was gonna be some consent issues, but uh, that was all resolved fairly quickly. Zach is actually a friendly, very kind and caring ghost that lets uh, Danny have her privacy that isn't creeping on her too much while she doesn't want people there and um, they get together fairly quickly and he and she are both aware of each other when they get together and there's really great consent in this as well so I was really pleasantly surprised. And once the novella started going I saw a lot of parallels with another movie that I really like called Just Like Heaven. If you've seen that you can probably predict what th this novella is going to end up with. Um, this book is fairly predictable anyway but I really enjoyed it for what it was and I got what I wanted out of it a super short sweet uh, romance that is really Halloween uh, themed. Then I picked up Get Alive Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. I feel like this is a booktube favorite this past year. It was a book of a month choice and I think for good reason. I really really enjoyed this book. So this book is own voices for the British black representation as well as the chronic illness representation. And this book follows Chloe Brown who is kind of well off. She comes from a very well off family. She also has a lot of chronic illness issues. I believe she has fibromyalgia. One day she has this near-death experience that prompts her to get a life and one of those things is to ride a motorcycle and uh, go camping and do things that she wouldn't normally do. So the hero in this book is named Red. He is super caring, super considerate of her, and I really loved their relationship together. So there's a lot of things to love in this book. I'm probably not gonna cover them all here, but there's lots of reviews out there. But I really liked how Red seemed to know when to ask Chloe how she was feeling, how she was doing. You know, she deals with a lot of daily chronic pain before she even had to voice it. That to me, I think meant a lot to Chloe, meant a lot to me reading it, and I'm pretty sure will mean a lot to people uh, that are reading this as well. So that representation I think was just so solid, so important and so golden while reading this. Red is very aware that his romance interest, his love interest is black and obviously vice versa. So um, I really enjoyed it overall and I didn't see any of that race splaining from Chloe that I hate in other books that have uh, mixed relationships. So uh, I really got along with it. Looking forward to more by Hibbert. Then I finally read Forbidden by Beverly Jenkins. This is a historical romance that is the first in her Old West series. I think Wild West series. So this story follows Ryan who is actually white passing but is actually uh, the descendant of an ex-slave ex person. And also it follows Edie who is traveling from Denver, trying to head to California. She unfortunately gets stranded in the middle of the desert by a very evil person. And Ryan comes and saves her and takes her back to his saloon and takes help, helps her get on back on her feet again. I really like how Ryan uses his privilege and his status in the society to uplift other black folks. He does that a lot. He, you know, allows black folks to enter his saloon. He also helps them, 
get mortgages and uh, financially helps them in their community, which is coming a, becoming a bit more accepting. He also has a seat, uh, a political role in their community as well. So the main issue here I think is racism and it's 1870s Old West. So there's a lot of disadvantages to Ryan telling people that he is actually black and that he has been using his white passing privilege for loans and for a seat on the city council. So his relationship with Edie hinges on a lot of that and he would have to give up a lot to be with her. But I really loved their relationship. I really loved Ryan and Edie and I really loved the community that, that they have in their small town. And overall, I just think it was a really great historical fiction with people of color at the center. So I highly recommend you pick up Forbidden by Beverly Jenkins if you have no idea where to start with her. Okay, then next I picked up The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. This is another contemporary romance and this is own voices for that Asperger's representation. So this is the story of Stella who is a uh, Echometrist, that, that's a word. Um, she's a very, very skilled mathematician that kind of forecasts things, math stuff that I don't know anything about. But she's really good at her job, but not so good within her love life. She struggles because with connecting with people because of her Asperger's. So she hires a male escort to show her how to do love, how to do relationships. And Michael is a college student that is a male escort and that helps Stella along the way. And um, I really liked this book. So this is a debut from Huang. And I think that I, while I really enjoyed reading it, as I was reading it, it kind of has faded since I finished it. And I'm not exactly sure why. The representation in this book is by far the best part of it. I really liked uh, hearing a lot of that Asperger's uh, autism struggles that Stella has how caring Michael is with her, how patient he is with her, and how willing he is to understand all of the issues that she has and why she struggles to connect with people. Uh, I really love seeing a protagonist like Stella, who is a badass, really ambitious, really smart woman in STEM and who still has everyday things happen to her too. You know, her mother uh, knows that she is 30 and not with kids and pressures her to get married soon. So um, all those dynamics I think were really great. I really loved that Michael isn't shamed for being a male escort at any time in this book because uh, he's a sex worker and uh, I really think that I'm looking forward to more from Huang, but this one was just okay for me. And the last romance that I read last year was called Long Shot by Kennedy Ryan. This is the first in her sports series called Hoops. And this book was a lot. I knew it was a lot going into it, but it was a lot. Um, this is own voices for the black representation. And this book first and foremost is about domestic abuse and there's a lot of trigger warnings for this so please take care before you read this book because um, it's it's very very heavy and hard to read at times. So Longshot is a contemporary romance that is a second chance romance. It does center again on those very heavy themes of domestic abuse, of violence, of rape and assault and yet our main heroine is able to have her happily ever after. So it's pretty long book. I think it was one of the longest romance books that I read last year, but I think it's so worth it if you're willing to read a book with this very, very harsh content. Our heroine Iris is a sports commentator. That's what she loves. She loves the NBA. And our hero is named August and he is a NBA hopeful. He's actually sort of a NBA star. They both meet at a bar while he is on um, on the eve of his championship game. And they really hit it off. They have those initial sparks fly, but of course it doesn't work out. Uh, Iris is actually in a relationship with the main antagonist, with sort of the evil of this book. And Caleb is just a horrible, horrible human being. And I usually don't like it whenever authors sort of have this one stroke to their characters, to their villains. But in this case, I think that Caleb needed to be just pure evil. And he definitely was because the, the abuse in this book is insidious. It is sort of subtle at first. And I think that she really takes care in building the realistic, um, 
the realistic structure of an abusive relationship. At first, Caleb, you know, starts to control Iris slightly by saying, you should wear your hair like this. You should dress like this. You should let me put my arm around you in public. Whenever he's threatened by August, you know, he has a very physical sort of control of her. And slowly that control steamrolls and snowballs into physical abuse. However, you know, there's still a romance in this. There's still hope for Iris to have that real romance that she so deserves. And there are actually some swoon-worthy moments with August throughout that keep you going and that keep that levity and that bright light that you know is at the end of the tunnel for Iris. There's a chilling scene with a gun that I will never forget that is done in this book. And yet Iris has the will and the time and the healing to not only reclaim her body, but to share it with someone else. And I think that that's the biggest message in this book. I, August isn't a perfect hero. I actually had some issues with some of his language. Um, I won't mention that here, but um, yeah, he's not perfect, but I, I overall just really love the message in this book. I know Kennedy Ryan did a lot of research for this book. I believe she interviewed a, a number of uh, sexual assault and domestic abuse survivors to really make sure that that representation is done well. And I think it really shows it's well worth all the work to get through to get to Iris's happy ending. Okay, and those are all the romance books that I read last year. So um, yeah, that was quite a bit. So looking forward to revisiting some of these authors, kind of continuing on some of these series and finding more romance authors that I love. But if you've read any of these books or if you wanna read some of them now, make sure to leave a comment in the comments down below. And I hope to see you in the next video. But for now, thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye.